Hi, everyone. John Liebman here. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com, the number one site for learning bass online. We have a special guest this week, Dave Miros, played with Spock's Beard and Iron Butterfly and Mark Lindsay. I'm so happy to talk to you. How you doing, Dave? Great. Good to be here. How are you doing? Good. Thank you, Mark Lindsay. Boy, I played some shows on the same show as Paul Revere and the Raiders. So yeah. I got to know some of those guys and uh, reading your bio really took me back, brought back some great memories. Oh, I see you have a little friend there over your shoulder. I didn't yeah. see. <laughs> yeah, that's why I have a couple cats in here and that's why I have all the stuff on the couch. Cats love leather, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Well, with the Zoom, I hope they won't make me sneeze, but uh, I'll, I'll take the chance. Uh, you started out, I know, playing a lot of brass instruments. Didn't you play uh, French horn, trombone, trumpet, tuba? How did you end up as a bass player? Well, actually, I started on piano. My dad got an old piano when I was a kid, and I was interested in that. And he asked me if I wanted lessons. And I got really into that for a few years. And then I got into uh, middle school and and everybody, you know, there was very little use for a piano player and there was a lot of use for a horn player in a band in high school and, and middle school. So I started playing those instruments. And then when I was, I continued on with that into college. I was at UC Berkeley playing in the jazz band and some friends of mine there were starting a rock band and they wanted a bass player. And um, I wish I had the gear that the guitar player lent me to start off on because it was a 63 jazz bass and mm. and this really cool tube amp <laughs> which you know is worth a fortune now it's just a the pr most great bass to start on but he asked me if i wanted to start playing bass and uh, i had fooled around on guitar a little bit taken like two or three lessons i knew where the strings were and a couple of the notes and so that's how i started playing bass when i was about 20 in college and started gigging like right after that. I mean, weeks after that, we had a little fraternity party gig or something. And, and there so it you, went. You knew uh, A, D, and E, and that's all you needed for a gig, right? Yeah. And, you know, interestingly, I found out at that moment that I had always been a bass player. I just didn't know it yet because I listened to bass parts more than anything else. And mm. I had, you know, all of the music that I had heard up until my life kind of all the bass parts kind of stored in my head and so picking up the bass and actually starting to play those things up to the proficiency level of doing a cover band gig um, you know came really quick because I already had all I didn't have to really learn the parts in my head I had them in there what were you listening to in your formative years oh man I was all over the place I still am kind of um but I used to listen to a lot of Motown and the early rock, you know, because I'm old and it was the 60s. And I was waiting for you to say Motown and James Jamerson. Yeah. Oh, those that's what an era for bass playing that was. The rock and the Motown stuff. And then a little bit later, the funk, the 60s and early 70s were just so good. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah. So and then I got into the jazz for a while. I never really learned. I was before I started playing bass, all of this. So uh, unfortunately, I never was a jazz bass player, which would have been really good for me at this point. But I never did that. Uh, but I listened to it and listened to fusion and then really hard rock. I mean, Black Sabbath and Deep Purple and all that stuff. I was all over the place. Maynard Ferguson, you know, just, uh -huh. just ping ponging wildly back and forth between styles of music. I was this close to getting the gig with Maynard. I oh, had a man. Really strong recommendation from one of the sax players in the band. And it was between me and one other guy. And the guy that got it had a really strong recommendation from the outgoing bass player who had mm. been going over the book with him. So, oh, man. I can understand why they gave it to him. It was him. a close one. It was a close one. That would have been really fun. Yeah. That well, guy was my idol for a really long time. I went and saw me and my buddies. We just talk about Maynard and listen to Maynard. And we went to got three or four of his concerts. And, you know, that was, he was my man for a long time. It's funny because my, my mother grew up in Canada 
And I, I mentioned Maynard Ferguson one time. She says, Maynard Ferguson, he used to play at a place called, I think, Crystal Beach or something like that. And she, she said he was nothing. He was just like a local guy. And he, huh. I guess that was very, very early in his career. Yeah. But uh, who were some of your other bass player influences once you discovered the bass, of course? All the, uh, you know, the James Jamerson and Carol Kay and all those guys, Bob Babbitt and, you know, just that whole soul thing. And then, of course, a little bit later, Lewis Johnson and um, um, Space in his name now, the Sly guy. Sly Larry Lewis, Graham. Larry Graham. And then, you know, Paul McCartney, huge influence. Um, later on, you know, guys that you wouldn't normally think of, like David Hungate, the, the Toto bass yep. player. The man who has never played an in inappropriate note in his life, I don't think. Right. He just plays the perfect part all the time, every note, perfect, perfect. Yeah. So those kind of guys, you know, and Duck Dunn and, and then um, uh, John Entwistle and, of course, Chris Squire and Getty Lee and Rocco Prestia. Supr and surprisingly, not Jocko very much. Although every time I heard him, it was just mind blowing, but it was a little too mind blowing, you know. In yeah. in his place, it was uh, and for the jazz guy. My favorite guy was Percy Jones. Yeah, I love him. I, I've interviewed every single one of those people you mentioned, except oh, James Jamerson Sr. Yeah. and uh, Duck Dunn. But James Jamerson Jr. used to live not too far from me, and you know when somebody lives close by, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it, man, and. and it just never happened. And unfortunately oh, yeah. he passed away, but yeah. Uh, yeah, you're, you're definitely speaking my language. Those are some <laughs> great bass players. Oh, no, no. Lewis Johnson. I did not interview, but I uh, uh, met his brother at a, a tribute. There was a tribute to him at bass player live. And cool. his brother, I guess it was George that came and yeah, that was, that was beautiful. You mentioned UC Berkeley. Yeah. Uh, I think you and I seem to have a lot in common because we, like we both studied music in college and we both studied business in college and people mm. used to tell me they thought that was a strange combination and i i never understood what was so strange about that yeah well it kind of is the personalities are really different between a businessman and a musician um my personality lands kind of right in the middle uh but you know you have to go to college for something yeah. I actually went there believing that I could be like a biochem major or something. And at Berkeley, you know, if you start taking the hard science classes, you find out really quickly, there's a lot of brilliant people there that are leaving you in the dust. <laughs> and so within a few weeks, I knew that I wasn't going to hang with all the, you know, cause that's all the pre-med guys and all those. So I figured I better switch to something a little bit more practical well, did oh, oh, so you went to music? <laughs> no, I I got a music minor accidentally. Oh, oh, oh you're talking. Oh, this is leading up to the business part. Yeah, I started taking business classes. Oh, okay, it's like okay, I'll I I know where my lane is now. More of the traditional what you go to school for, you know. Yeah, so you you have some experience in music industry management as well, right? Or Eric Burden and the Animals. Yeah, yeah. After a, a plan with him for. a three, four years, um, we needed a tour manager. And I had been around long enough in that organization to see how everything needed to work. And uh, so I just volunteered to do it. And it was a really good experience. Added a little bit of income in there too, you know, so between playing and the tour manager thing, it was, uh, you know, a, it was a good gig. Chaz Chandler's name come up a lot. Or once in a while? Yeah, you know, Eric was not that... F Eric loved Chaz, but it was always a very competitive thing. Chaz was a very controlling kind of guy. And and Eric is a guy that can't be controlled. So, you know, they had their clashes. <laughs> <laughs> he used to, when we'd sign, sign albums, he used to, like, sometimes deface Chaz's picture. <laughs> Well, Chaz is also known as the guy who discovered Jimi Hendrix. Is that really true or is that a legend? Yeah, he, um, Hendrix went to uh, England. Or no, I think Chaz heard him somewhere. He, Chaz might have been in the States. 
he heard this guy, Jimi Hendrix, this kid, and said, you, you got to come to England. I'll hook you up. Trust me. But yeah, he, he did pretty much discover Hendrix. I mean, he didn't discover him from the beginning, but he's the guy that gave him the huge boost. I, I could ask you all about the... Uh... It's, that's that was your your big moment huh one of your big moments i'm sure huh that band had a bunch of good bass lines it was yeah. a it was a fun band eric always encouraged everyone in the band to uh express themselves too so you know he didn't really like playing it exactly like the record and um you know he wanted at least during your solo parts or during jam parts or something he wanted everyone to express themselves and and be you know a little bit more than just a uh, tribute thing and you know he was very generous that way were the audiences into that or did they want it like they knew it from the records they want it pretty close to the records which uh we played with brian auger for a while oh boy and that was super fun but it got taken in a really jazzy direction and it was really a good band but it was started to get kind of a little bit harder to book because uh, you know, people want to hear the oldies the way they, the way the records were. And then when Brian left, we brought it back to the uh, original arrangements. Uh, I have got to ask you about iron butterfly. There were a lot of people in that band over the years. Were, were, did you play with any of the original members? Um, yes. Uh, one time I replaced Lee Dorman who passed away. Oh, and but before he passed away, they were still doing gigs. It was Lee Dorman and Ron Bushy, the drummer in the in the band. And Lee had some kind of heart procedure that he had to do and he had to miss a gig in 2006. And so I filled in for him and I played with Ron Bushy. Um, then when the band got formed, you know, the, it's one of those bands that the original guys kind of got filtered out one by one. And I replaced the last guy. And so, what, you know, when I joined, there were no remaining members left. But there were guys in there that had played with them for 10, 20 years, you know, played with all the It was a very strange band and hard to book because of that. No original members. Yeah. But it was another band with that. That is one of my new inspiration bass players. It was Lee Dorman. Huh. What a great bass player he was. And no one knows. You think of Inagata De Vita and that plodding bass line, but man, you start learning the set. What great bass parts. That was really fun for me to play the gigs because of the bass parts. To be honest with you, I don't know too many other songs in their catalog other than Inagata. Yeah, well, that's the one. I mean, that was it for me. <laughs> that's I had an iconic bass line, man. That had to be fun yeah. too. Like. I am old enough to remember when Inagana De Vida was, was a current hit on the radio. And oh, I, I remember reading somewhere that the original title for that song was supposed to be in the garden of Eden. Yeah. But the record company thought that was a little too suggestive. Does that ring a bell? Is that true? Do you, as far as you know? Well, what Ron used to say is um, Doug was, writing the song and drinking a bunch of wine and Ron went to work. He had a night job and he came back like really late at night. And, and, um, Doug was just hammered writing this song. And he, he, he said, I wrote this song and it's called in the garden of Eden, but he slurred it. And it sounded like in a God of the Veda, you know? And, and so Ron goes, wow, what a cool name. And he wrote it down phonetically. So he wouldn't forget it. And the next day, uh, he said, that was a really good song you're working on. We should work on that and, and, you know, work it up. And he goes, what was the name of it? In Agata De Vida. And, and Doug started laughing. He's going, no, it was, but that's good. Let's go with that. That's <laughs> I think I like that story even better than the one I read. <laughs> that's funny. What's uh, switching gears here? What's, what's happening with Spock's beard? We're just kind of waiting for the next inspiration, you know, and, and whatever comes up, we, Actually, right now, we would have been in England right now doing a little UK thing. But, um, you know, when Omicron emerged, we decided we better cancel while there's still time. Never know what's coming up. We booked the UK gigs a year ago, 
over a year ago and we figured by now everything would be kind of cleared up but but no we're thinking of rescheduling it for that and a bunch more gigs actually for next year just keep pushing stuff off year for <laughs> it's like well we're getting older you know we better like do something so what is what's keeping you busy then well we've got this pattern seeking animals thing that's oh, right 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 and um cover band you know used to keep me really busy but that has really declined in the past two or three years as well you know i mean just i have very low overhead i'm kind of semi-retired and but the pattern seeing animals thing right now is keeping me so busy. Learning that set is like one of the hardest sets I've ever had to learn. There's, it doesn't sound hard. You start learning it, though, and there's a, so much memorization. It's driving me nuts. I just stopped doing it, you know, a few minutes before this. And, and you go through a song and you think you have it and you leave it for a few days and bring it back up. And there's a couple parts. It's like, what happened? Yeah. You're, are you in L.A. now? Not anymore. I'm up in Sacramento now. Oh, Sacramento. Okay. So you're still in California. Uh, in reading up about your bass gear, I learned a new word, uh, Fendenbacher. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what, if, if a Fender and a Rickenbacker had a baby, that would be your bass? Pretty much. It's, it's almost exactly 50-50. I mean, I, I just started this weird project. Um, I cut the body out myself. I bought a piece of alder and, and made the body. And wow. then um, I put a uh, jazz bass neck on it. And um, then it's a Rickenbacker shaped body, but it's contoured like a fender, you know, with the little bevel and the little belly cut in the back. And, the, and uh, it's got two sets of pickups, one where Rick pickups would be, and then two other pickups where fender pickups would be. And, and so it's like a, you know, it was supposed to be a one base for everything kind of deal. I actually did that to a Rickenbacker a long time ago and I, a real Rickenbacker. And I don't, I didn't have that anymore. So I wanted to kind of recreate it. And uh, it's a cool base. I use it for could, Fox all the time. It works great. I could never get comfortable with a Rickenbacker. I always felt like I had to hold my arms like this off to the side instead of having the base in front. Yeah, it does. Everyone thinks they're super long scale because they do sit a little bit yeah. to the left. I guess you have it's to get used to it. Rickenbackers are, are acquired taste. Um, it's, it's a different horn altogether than a Fender. And what you have to do if you're used to playing Fenders, you have to really want the sound that the Rickenbacker does yeah. and then adapt your playing to it because it is what it is. And okay. Uh, what about the, the rest of your gear? You're a, a big fan of hip shot, aren't you? Oh yeah. Yeah. When they first, that company first came out, the guitar, I used to, I was working in a music store a little bit and the guitar repair guy comes up with this magazine. He goes, look at this thing. This is something you might like. And it was when they first came out and I just went, Oh man, that is something I would like. So I I've been with them since the beginning. I've got them on so many bases. I just so have you were, you were never into five strings then. Well, this is pre five string. Ah, I mean, there may have been, you know, Jimmy Johnson may have had his then. This was like 82, 81, wow. something like that. When the hip shot first started, I can't remember that where, where that was. They were in LA at first before they moved east. And I went down and met the guys and and uh you know borisov right dave boris yeah, yeah super josh nice. i know real well josh borisov and uh i still you know if it's a if it's a four string bass i play five string a lot now i started playing five string in the in the later 80s maybe 86 87 and then stopped playing it for a long time and then started again uh maybe 10 12 years ago and but if i'm if it's a four string, I'll put a hip shot on, a hip shot on it for sure. It's, it kind of has to have one. Uh, also, there's some, yeah, yeah, they're so handy. I was going to say there's there's some five string players that that use a hip shot on that. You'd, some some guys just can't get low enough. <laughs> so. I knew a guy who had a custom bass designed that had the strings arranged so the B string, the the tuner on the B string was 
had enough room between the B and the E so he could put a hip shot on the E because that lever flies down. Wow, that I never heard of. It's like, what a great idea because an open D sounds way cooler than a D on a five string, you know, the low D. So I go, man, what a brilliant idea that was. Yeah, that is clever. Wow. Let's talk about playing bass and learning bass. We've got so many people coming to forbassplayersonly.com from all over the world to learn how to play bass. And most of them are in their, they're, they're boomers. They're in their 50s, 60s, 70s. They're not trying wow. to be rock stars and set yeah. the world on fire. They've always wanted to do this. They want to play some of that. You mentioned the great music from the sixties and seventies. That's what they love. Classic rock riffs, blues shuffles. By the way, I just added a, a course in soul bass on for bass mm. which is getting a tremendous response. But I say that just to give you some context with that kind of clientele, what advice do you have for somebody who wants to learn base what do you think is important for them to know uh one of the biggest lessons for me was you have to want to be a bass player you know and play bass like a bass player should play i mean prog rock here i am you know with all these bands and just going crazy with the everything but most of the time it's holding it down and you know i had a really really big epiphany once i saw eric clapton playing in the 80 81 or something and duck dunn was playing with him and i was all excited to see duck dunn thought he was going to be jamming it was going to be great he played the bass parts and that was all 90 minute set whatever he didn't deviate one time and i had been one of those guys i was learning to slap and i was just being slapping on tom petty songs and you know <laughs> just being a complete ass showing off thought i was making everything better I used to do that too. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I watched him and I was very disappointed with duck down for a while until about halfway through. And, and I was like, Oh my God, you know, that feeling w when you say something really wrong and you get really embarrassed that I know that feeling very well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just ask my wife <laughs> blush and you start getting kind of sweaty and a little bit <laughs> nauseated. I had during the middle of that concert, I had that feeling. It's like, oh man, I've been completely blowing it up until now, you know? And, and it changed me as a bass player. And so, you know, that's really important that you realize your place and it's really fun to play bass and you, you need to be happy with doing that. You know, having said that, I mean, look at all the bass players that are out now, all these, you know, technique guys. But uh, but they uh, also know how to lay it down. Victor Wooten can lay it down. Oh, Billy Sheehan can lay it down. Stanley yeah. Clark could lay it down. Jocko could lay it down. You know, I yeah. mean, John Patitucci can play rock as good as anybody else. Yeah, but he takes care of business. Yeah, that's such an important lesson, and uh, I, I wish more people understood it. I, I I think it's harder to get through to to the young people because. When you're at that stage, it's like, you know, I was like that. And, and I still have a little bit of that in me. But when it comes down to taking care of business, I, I take care of business. And that's what I drill into all of my students and everybody yeah. else. So oh, I do have one more question for you, Dave. Sure. If you can imagine, and I know you've played a lot of instruments. So uh, what would you be if you were not a bass player? But it, it's got to be something outside of music. Um, wouldn't be a biochemical engineer, I'm guessing, right? No, <laughs> I have no idea because I never had to make the decision what I was going to be when I grew up. And, but I do, there was a point in my life where I wanted to be in construction and I really, really enjoy working with my hands. So maybe some kind of woodworker or carpentry or something. I gathered that when you told me about how you cut the body of your, what was an alder body for your base? Yeah. yeah. I'm always tinkering. I have all these bases and they're all mutilated by me. You know, <laughs> wonder what it would sound like if I put this on there and, you know, get the router. Here we go. There you go. Well, 
<laughs> well, it, it's so great getting to know you, sitting down one on one with you like this. And uh, you know what? Those those tours will come together. The world has to get back to normal eventually. Congratulations on all your success. Much luck and continued success and good things to you with uh, Spock's beard and pattern seeking animals and everything else you're working on. Well, thanks. And it was great to talk to you. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to meeting you in person one day. My wife and I love going to California. We've never been quite that far north to Sacramento, but uh, yeah. you know, maybe that's a good reason to go. Yeah, just hang, hang out with the cats and, you know. There you go. <laughs> Take my allergy medicine first. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us as our special guest this week. It was You're my watching. Pleasure. You're watching the premier number one site for learning bass online for bassplayersonly.com. I'm John Liebman. Let's play bass.